refreshing, a renewal right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, have your way. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Right now, we declare that chains are being broken right now in the name of Jesus. We declare that, God, you are opening doorways right now in the name of Jesus. We declare freedom right now in the name of Jesus. We declare restoration right now in the name of Jesus. We declare healing right now in the name of Jesus. Anxieties and fears and depression be gone in the name of Jesus. Worries, doubts be gone in the name of Jesus. Right now we submit into your hands those plans, into your hands our desires, our visions, our future. Right now in the name of Jesus, we place those at your feet. We trust fully in you right now in the name of Jesus. And as we place that trust in you, as we place that trust in the very hands of you, God, Holy Spirit, you are going to renew our soul as that is your word that you are going to renew our strength because that is your word. You're going to renew our vision and our mind because that is your word. That we're going to put on the garments of joy. That you're going to renew our joy in the name of Jesus because that is your word. Holy Spirit, we just glorify your name. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. For you are worthy of all of those things, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way, God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We're going to sing that chorus one more time. Just one more time. Let's praise God this morning. Yes, Jesus. hearts we make room in our minds lord wherever we have idols set up wherever we have things that are in the way god let us cast those before your feet today true intimacy with you requires us giving all of us to you god so let us give it all those things that we don't want to give up god let us freely give those things up the sin the things that so easily entangle us the weights the burdens the fears Let us give them to you, God, and see what you might do. God, you are our King, you are our Lord, you are our Savior. Let us not hold anything back from you. You are our God, we worship you. We thank you for the intimate touch of your presence, God. That you desire to mold and change us to make us more like you. lay it at your feet. Jesus, take me. Take me. Have your way with me today. Let me not be the same as when I walked in. Let me be forever changed by your presence, God. Giving you everything to see your kingdom built, to see your kingdom come, to see your will be done, to see lives change, to see the gospel go forth, to see freedom, to see deliverance, to see your people walking in truth, to see the world transformed by your spirit, God. We can't do it if we're holding things back, if we're holding stuff back from you. So God, let us freely give it all to you. 
that we could be transformed into the image of Jesus. That we can live like Jesus. That we could be ministers of the gospel in the way that Jesus has called us to be. Setting people free, God. We thank you for your presence. It's here now. Your grace is here now. Give it up. Give it up to him. Give it all to him. Everything. Everything. Give it to him now. He desires to take it to make you new, to make you a new creation. He wants your burdens. He wants your brokenness. He wants your, he wants even the the shortcomings in your life, your sin. He wants to take it to transform you, to make you new. God, we thank you that you don't require anything of us except to give it all. Thank you, God. Your gifts are perfect. Every gift that you give is perfect. We worship you, God. We honor you, God. We thank you, Father. And God, we just ask that this moment would not go by, Lord, as something that that happened on a Sunday. But Lord, let us take this moment with us. Let us practice being refreshed and renewed in your presence, God. Let us practice resting in you, God. seated, I'd like you to greet somebody that you didn't come to church with today. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God is good all the time. Whew. Now, if you didn't have a chance to come up here, man, if there's prayer time afterward, get get up here. The Lord is, we invited him. Man, I, 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 it's, he's here. He's, yeah, come on. Praise God, praise God. Well, if you're here with us today at Grace Church for the first time or the first time in a while, or you just haven't filled out a visitor card yet, Matt, we saw your visitor card. Thank you for that. Thank you. We're going to have to sit down and have a talk with you. Uh, If if you'd like to put, uh, we have uh, visitor cards in the seat backs there. If you'd like to fill those out, just give us your name and number. We'd like to buy you lunch, coffee, uh, show you what the vision of our church is, pray with you, see if there's anything that we can do to meet your needs. But we want to check and see if this might be the church that you like to fellowship with us on a regular basis at. And out of the deal, you get free lunch, free coffee. So you might as well take us up on it. You're going to get prayed for. You're going to get free stuff. So fill out those cards. All we need is your name and number. And we'd like to connect with you. Amen? Amen. So I uh, actually uh, found out that I have the sixth sense yeah, yeah. I can actually tell. I can tell 
how judgmental people are just by looking at them. Mm-hmm. Yep. That w- see, because that would make me judgmental because I just, because I look at people. What's that? Y- oh. <laughs> I got a smile. <laughs> All righty. We finally made Adam laugh after how, how many months? We got it. All right. Amen. Amen. I had to switch it up. Amen. Praise God. Speaking of judgmental, there aren't a lot of judgmental people here at this church, so we're, we praise God for that. But if you'd like to join us, we have our Sunday evening Bible study tonight. That's at 6 p.m. with Pastor Annette Gardner. And, man, that's been a powerful study where we've really been learning about God and his word Man, some of, some of the things that she has brought as far as we as the church, we want to give people our good advice and try to change them and make them more like Christ. And, and her encouragement is let the Holy Spirit work. Let him do the work of changing and transforming. And it's not going to be on our timetable, but man, let us trust in the Holy Spirit to bring them into the character of Christ that he has called them to. Man, there's some anointed words that, that Pastor Annette has brought. So if you want to hear anything that encouraging, come here tonight at 6 p.m. We're walking through Colossians. We're on chapter 4. Okay, chapter 4. So we are on pace to get it done here in the next few weeks. Tonight? Oh, okay. Well, tonight's the finale. All right, all right. Well, we'll, we'll we look forward to that. That's been a great study. Amen. Then also we have our Wednesday morning men's prayer. Men of God praying here together, seeking after his face, pressing in for your needs, praying for one another. That's 7 a.m. Wednesday mornings. There's donuts as well. But we, we believe that prayer is what changes hearts and lives. We believe that prayer is what has brought our church to where we're at now. We believe that God moves through prayer no matter how small the gathering. So men, if you're able to be here 7 a.m. on Wednesdays, and then also we have our corporate prayer later that day, Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m., that's where we all kind of press in, seek God's face, and every Wednesday night's been different. We've never had one Wednesday night that looks the same from one Wednesday to the next. So if you want, if you want to, uh, to see what our, our corporate prayer is all about, man, it's been a powerful time. God moves uniquely, and so you're missing out if you're not able to make it. Amen. And then we've also got our Woe Flow this Friday. Yes, Woe Flow, 7 p.m., worship and floats. So that is, we we have root beer floats. We have all sorts of different flavors. We're going to have to buy all new ice cream because it's been a while since we've done them. So we're going to have to toss that old stuff out. So you'll get fresh, fresh soda, fresh floats. Not that you weren't getting it before, but we promise it'll be brand new. So, but it's been a great time of of worshiping, of seeking God's face. And man, that's, that's just sort of where it's kind of more open. We just, we allow the Holy Spirit to really flow. There's no Hey, we got to get into anything else. It's just let's rest in his presence. Let's, let's rest in each other's presence. Let's fellowship with one another. Let's seek the face of God. And man, woe flow has been powerful. So that's this Friday, the 27th at 7 p.m. And real quick, we're on our, our socials. We have uh, our fa- – oh, did I put that slide in there? I did not. Okay. We're on Facebook and YouTube, and we're thankful for everybody who's able to watch uh, on those streaming platforms really helps us out. And then also we do have a sign-up sheet. Uh, We have our deliverance classes. Oh, there we are. He found it. So that's where you can join us there on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble to be coming soon. And then we also have our deliverance classes that are going to be coming up again. We, We have an entire team that's been sort of trained up in that, but we're opening the door for a new deliverance team as well to come alongside us. So if you're interested in deliverance, in praying for that sort of thing, if you have questions, if you just want to know what deliverance about, these deliverance classes are a great way for you to get plugged in there. And so that, that, those classes will be led by Pastor Annette, and those are going to be usually on a Saturday. So that's kind of time frame where we're looking at. But we have a sign-up sheet in the back. We'd like you to sign up for that. Let us know if you're interested. Let us know if you have questions. Hey, what's going on with it? Let us know. If you have any interest at all, we would love to be a church that walks in that. And so the more people we can get trained up in that, the better off we'll be as a church and prepared. Amen. With that, let's invite our ushers to come forward for the giving of the tithes and offerings. Let us pray. 
God, we thank you so much. God, we honor and bless you. God, we come before your presence with thanksgiving. We come into your courts with praise. Lord, you are God, you are king. We worship you. And our worship continues today as we go forth. Our worship continues as we give. Our worship continues as we listen to our pastor. Our worship continues as we walk out those doors, God. Let us continue to have a heart of worship for you in all that we do and all that we say, God. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that as pastor brings forth the word today, Lord, anything that we've had of our old traditions that aren't true of what your word says, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see those and you would break off any lies and deceptions in Jesus' name, Lord. Let the word that comes forth be powerful and be fruitful to transform our lives and make us more like Jesus today. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And kids, you are dismissed for Children's Church. Hallelujah. How many of you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. You know, I love how God just kind of shows up, right? We come expecting God to move, but when he moves, we're sometimes surprised at how he moves or when he's moving or, or why he's moving. But still, we should never stop that, that attitude of coming, expecting him to show up. Right. Amen. That's his promise. That's his, that's his purpose. That's his plan. That's his heart's desires to be where his people are. Oh, and it has been... An amazing week. I know some, some people have, have had kind of a crazy week, but for me it's been a good week, and hopefully for all of you it's been a good week. I do want to thank uh, Matt Peterson over here. He came in, I asked him to come in and do some work on the church, and, and he came in and he install, installed the handrails that you see in the women's bathroom and in the men's bathroom. If you use the bathrooms today, you would have seen those. If you haven't, then go look at them after service. It's really kind of a nice deal. He extended our... our uh, our, our um, sound booth a little bit as well, so our our very expensive soundboard isn't tilting anymore. We 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 very are very much grateful for that. But you know, we want to thank anybody who does work here is a blessing, amen. amen. And I know that we just finished last week our series going over heart of deliverance. And I know that through the course of that series, that we've seen many people set free in this church from bondage, from oppression, from things that they were battling. Amen. Amen. And I know that, that I'm going to do our recap just one more time, right? Y'all, y'all should know our recap one more time, right? Okay. So, so let's, let's, let's hit it one more time that, that Christians can have a demon, but a demon cannot have a Christian. A Christian cannot be possessed, but they can be oppressed right and the point of deliverance is so that we can be free because christ came to set us free that we may be free indeed amen meaning we're we're not held back by any bondage or oppression any longer that we're living freely as christ intended us for us to live Amen? amen amen so next week there will be a quiz on those three recaps but this morning, I'm excited to, that we're starting a new series titled Foundational Truths. And I think this is very important because we have to know the foundations of which our beliefs lie in, right? We have to know the foundation of what we believe and understand that we're, not, we're talking about the foundational truths of the body of Christ, okay? The foundational truths of the body of Christ, meaning the truths that the whole body of Christ lives by. That every single Christian, no matter what denomination they belong to, agrees on these foundational truths. That's what we're looking at, okay? We're not looking at doctrinal truths. We're not looking, looking at those things that, that, that specific doctrine or specific groups of Christians hold to, but the foundational truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And during this topic, during this series, I know that we're going to be having our leadership team also be bringing aspects of foundational truths that is kind of laying heavily on their hearts as well. Um, so you will be hearing from our elders and, and possibly some of our other leadership team as well on foundational truths. And this morning, 
we're kind of talking about something that, that has completely changed my mindset on. And that I've, I've shifted my mindset on and drastically, actually really drastically about. This morning we're actually talking about salvation and baptism. Salvation and baptism. Because when we look at those two things, you're going, well, those are completely two different things. But we're going to look at this morning that, in fact, they are not two different things. That they are very connected in their, their function and in their purpose. And we're hitting this because and this is something I feel the majority of church today has limited to some extent. And we're going to be looking at both of these topics in more in depth going forward. But today we're just going to be doing a topographical look at salvation and baptism. In the coming weeks, we're going to look at salvation by grace fully. And we're also going to be looking at the baptisms fully. But this morning, we're going to be looking at them together. And as we're kind of looking at this, let's look at Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 28. Starting in verse 18, says this. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Right? So making disciples. How do we make disciples? Introducing them to who Jesus Christ is, right? Introducing them to the power of Christ, teaching them, raising them up in what that means. And in the very next line, what's it say? So he says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the very next step after being made a disciple, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And also that's a plug for the Trinity. But teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this is something that we are called to do. So if we're called to make disciples and to baptize people, it's something that we need to understand more of the purpose, right? So this morning we're going to dive in and look at these things that we need to take more seriously. So the first thing we're looking at is salvation. First thing we're looking at is salvation. Now salvation is God's grace, right? We all have, have a base understanding uh, uh, or knowledge of what salvation is. Salvation is God's grace. It is the gift of freedom from our sins that Jesus Christ took upon himself at the cross so that we may be free, right? So that we may know him and have relationship not only with Jesus Christ, but with the Father in heaven, okay? Now I'm going to hit some scriptures and we're going to be throwing a lot of scriptures at you this morning. In fact, I've, I, I think this might be, might be the sermon that I've ever preached with the most scripture ever. I'm really kind of excited about it. But second... What do I say? Second Corinthians. Pfft, wow. You know, sometimes when you're preaching and, and, and when you're teaching, I, don't, I know all of you have experienced that, right? But you, you look at your notes, and in my notes, I have second C-O-R, which I know in my head is Corinthians, but for some reason in my head, I looked at it and I said Colossians, and I had a little argument in my head going for a second. There's no second Colossians. What in the world? So that's why, that's why I had that pause there, just so you know. But second Corinthians 5.21 says this. And these are some powerful verses, foundational truth verses on who God is and what he did for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin in our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How powerful is that? The one who would never experience sin, the one who never understood sin, who never knew sin took on the sin of the universe in that moment, took on the sin of everyone, past, present, and future, out of love for us, Amen. right? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ because of what Christ did for us. Amen. Romans chapter 5, 6 through 11, and this is one of my, my favorite portions of Scripture. You see... At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. I, I really kind of love, love what, what Paul's saying there, right? That very rarely will anybody die. Although for a really good person, you may think about it, right? You may consider it if they're a really good person. 
But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How powerful is that? While we were still sinners, Christ looked at you, saw value in you, and said, I chose you. I am choosing you. While we were sinners, right? And a lot of us can consider that in our minds. Think about the time, the darkest time in your life. In that moment, Christ still died for you. You know, a lot of times the church is pushed, well, you need to take a shower before you take a bath, right? You need to get, cl- you're, you need to get cleaned up before you come into church. And that's not at all what Jesus did. Jesus said, I chose you at your dirtiest. I chose you at your darkest. I chose you in the moment where you thought you were worthless and I still saw worth in you. And I chose to come and die for you. Amen. Amen? Amen. That is the love of Christ for us. And not only for us, but for all creation, everybody in the world. I know you'll hear some people say, well, there's that whole thing about predestination. No, nowhere in the Bible does it say God chose you, but rejected them. Nowhere does it say that God chose this person, but chose not to choose this person. That is not the heart of God. It says that he chose us while we were still sinners. He saw worth and he saw value in us. So as believers, we have to take on that same heart, right? We can't choose who we share the gospel of Christ to. We can't value, we can't place value on people. Come on. Because Christ died for every person. So that means we share the gospel freely with everyone. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he gets a little bit more, a little bit more crazy here in verse 9. It says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies... While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? I love that. While we were still enemies, Christ chose to reconcile the wrongs between us. How many of us would do that with our enemies? How many of us would choose our enemies and say, you know what, I'm going to make this right, even though I know you're still hating me, even though I know you're not going to ever like me, even though I know that it's going to take a move of God for you to ever care about me, I'm making things right with you. How hard would that be for us to be or for us to do? A lot of times it takes the Holy Spirit doing that, right? But in God, he said, I don't care about any of that. I am making a way for you to come to me by giving you the most precious thing I have, which is my son. Not only is this, in verse 11, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. I love that. See, Paul is saying, while you were sinners, Christ died for you. While you hated him, he still desired you. He still desired relationship with you. And I love 1 John 1, 9 gives us an amazing promise. And he says this, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a, there, there's, there's a, a thing there, right? If you do this, I will do this. There comes a point where you've got to confess your sins, right? Paul even goes on to say later that, that if you confess your sins one to another, you will be healed. There's power in confession. Not only does power bring us healing, but power forgives or confession gives us freedom from our sins, cleanses us of our unrighteousness. But it takes that confession, right? It takes us doing that. And what I love about 1 John, it's one of the most important promises of Scripture because it gives us freedom and hope for the future. God is faithful in pursuing you daily. God is faithful in pursuing you at all times. He is faithful to never stop chasing after you. And how amazing is that? Because there's going to become a time when we get tired of chasing people. Right? We get tired of it. But God never gets tired of pursuing us. He never gets tired of desiring more time with us. And a lot of times we can say, well, that just sounds way too good to be true. It sounds way too easy, right? How can God love me if I I know what I've done? 
right? How can God possibly love me in that moment? And I know a lot of people battle with that all the time, is, is I'm not worthy of his love. You're not. He chose to make you worthy. He chose to make you in a position of worthiness for him. We're not worthy of it. None of us are. But through God's love, he makes you worthy. But pastor, you don't know what I, I don't care what you did. You don't know what I did. Right? Because in the darkest spot, Christ still reaches down, meets you in that moment in the darkness, meets you in that moment of your filth. And a lot of us have experienced filth in our lives. He met us there, right? That is the heart of salvation. That even though it may sound too good or completely different from anything we've ever experienced, it is the truth of God. Receiving a forgiveness that we don't deserve. But see, our salvation doesn't just stop at salvation, right? When we get saved, we don't just stay at the cross. When we get saved, and our, our job isn't just to gather other people to join us at the cross, right? But if we look at the purpose of salvation, if we look deeper into it, we discover that being saved, right, coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, means that we're not only saved from something, we're not saved from our sin, but we're saved for a purpose that Christ has in store for us individually, right? It's important to note that we're both saved and are also in the process of being saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2 says this. It says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, what, is, what does that mean? Because I thought that, that the moment I accepted Christ into my heart, I, 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 received, I received Holy Spirit and, that, and I was infilled and, and set free from all that stuff, that I was cleansed, all that stuff. Yeah, that's true. But you don't stop there, right? right. right? The process of being saved, we're not actually fully saved until we're with Him in glory. That's called sanctification, the process of being saved. Our sanctification ends when we're in heaven standing with him in glory. Amen? Amen. That's the end goal. That, that's the end result of our sanctification, of the process of being saved. Now, let's look at Romans thirteen eleven. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And I love, I love kind of looking at it in context with our mindset now. So, so, so Paul is saying, right, 60 years, actually this is the 60 years after the birth of Christ, 30 years after, after the, the death and resurrection of Christ, that he's saying, you know, our, our salvation is nearer now than when it was then. And now we're saying, well, it's nearer now than when it was then, right? right? But we're never in the, we're never, I mean, we should never stop pursuing Jesus Christ in our salvation. Amen? Receiving salvation through Jesus Christ isn't the end of the process of being saved. It's the beginning of a lifelong journey that daily we grow in Him. Daily we learn from Him. Daily we gain and glean from that relationship with Him. We are continually being shaped into the people that God has desired for us to be. That is the process of being saved. That is our walk with Him. Right? It starts at the cross, but you don't stay at the cross. It starts at the cross, because that is where Christ took the sins upon the world, upon himself, right? Where he died for us so that we may have new life, but we don't stay there. We continue walking. And the thing I love about salvation, the thing I love about God's mercy and about his grace, is if we fall and if we stumble, we don't go back to the cross. You don't start your salvation over, right? It's not like a video game where you die, you you have to start the level over. You pick yourself up in that place, right? You pick yourself up in that place. And if we're standing upon the truth of who Jesus Christ says he is, and if, we're, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, we don't go back there. We pick ourselves up and we continue moving from that point on. That's the whole purpose of repentance. Repentance is laying it down, saying, God, I'm sorry, forgive me for this. And then you go on. You continue moving. You continue walking. You don't start your salvation over, right? 
that would be a horrible experience. That would be a horrible thing to go through. This means becoming more and more like Christ. Something we do in a grateful thanksgiving of our salvation. Because as we become more like Christ, God works through us to share Christ's love and Christ's grace with the world. That is what we're called to do. Share Christ to the world. And some of us have a lot to share with the world. Some of us have, are in that place where I know exactly what you're going through. Let me show you how I got out of it. See, a lot of times we make witnessing to people so big in our minds, so heavy in our minds, when really it's just starting a conversation. What are you facing? What are you struggling with? And I love, I, 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 I love starting the conversation out with saying, hey, do you have fear, anxiety, or worry? Everybody has fear, anxiety, and worry, right? Let me show you somebody who can take that away from you. See, but as Matthew 28 tells us that we are to go. We are to go. We're not only called to go into the church. We're called also to go into the world. See, Christ gave us gifts that we use in the church, right? But we're not meant to just hoard our gifts in four walls. We're meant to hoard or give our gifts freely of ourselves, not only in the church, but in the world as well. Amen? Your gifts are for the church. And, and, and I love when people say, well, I'm called to the church. Okay. That could be your calling that God has called you. Now, if I were to say that upon myself, well, I'm called to be a pastor. I, I'm only called to shepherd you guys. But if somebody out there comes in here and says, hey, I want to know Jesus. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're, not, you're, you're not one of my sheep yet. I'm going to have to get somebody to come over here and save you first. And then I can work with you. How ignorant is that? I have my gift for the church, but my ultimate calling by Jesus Christ tells me to go. Amen? The call of Christ to all disciples of Christ overpowers and overshadows your individual calling. Because the call of Jesus Christ says to go to all his people. To go. So if you're saying my ministry is for the church only, I doubt that. Because Christ told you to go. But he called me here. He also said to go. But he said, I need to do it. he said to go. Go into all the world. Go. And if you don't know how to do it, get with somebody who knows how to do it, and they can train you how to do it. Amen? We have people in this church whose heart's desire is evangelizing. Get with them. Walk with them. Shadow them until you know how to go. Amen? But go. We have the salvation in us. And we have the knowledge of salvation in our hands. The most beautiful gift ever. More beautiful than anything. More sacred than anything. We have this gift. We should not be hoarding this gift. Amen? Amen. Salvation. Whew, I'm getting fired up up here. Number two. Baptism. Baptism. Now, when we're talking about baptism, this morning I am talking about the baptism of water, water baptism. Because we know and understand that if you understand Scripture, you know that there are multiple baptisms, not just water baptism. In fact, Scripture lists about eight different baptisms in the Bible. And Paul calls this the doctrine of baptism. We'll actually be talking about that in the coming weeks to kind of go over all of those baptisms individually. But the foremost reason that I want to focus on water baptism is because of its, close, its, its, its closeness to salvation. And we're going to be looking at that today. And also because in, we fall in the example of what Jesus Christ did himself. Right? So we see this actually in Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17. It says, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have the need to be baptized by you. And yet you are coming to me? But Jesus answered, said to him, Allow it this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. After he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and settling on him. And behold, a voice from the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom 
I am well pleased. Now, when we fully define it, water baptism is a public declaration of our faith in Jesus Christ, right? That is, that is what the, the definition of, of baptism is. It's the, the, the declar- public declaration of our faith in Jesus Christ and the outward demonstration of the inward transformation that takes place upon salvation when we received him as our Lord and Savior. Colossians chapter 2, 12 and 14 says this. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, or with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgotten us all our, tre- or forgiven, excuse me, forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. How powerful is that? Uh, I love how he brings that out. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us in its legal demands. We don't understand a lot of times that the enemy is very legal in how he does things. That's why if you give him a little space, he's going to take as much of it as he can. Because he understands the legality of open doorways. He understands the legality of those things. And a lot of times in our faith, we need to get more legal about the word of God. Right? We need to get more legal about this stuff and say, no, this is what the word of God says. No, this is what the word of God says. No, this is what the word of God says. We stand upon the word of God. We need to start using this more legally. Right? Right? But I love that. Canceling the record of debts that stood against us by its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The enemy has no legal right on you, except that which you give him. Amen? But having been buried in him with baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. See, water baptism is a symbol of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When we enter the water as a symbol of entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ, coming just as we are, clothed in our old life with all of his habits, mindsets, and behaviors. And I've even heard it kind of stated like this, and I, I found this kind of interesting, so I wanted to bring it out. That by allowing ourselves to be immersed in water by someone else during the process of water baptism, it's symbolic of willingly yielding our life to God's rulership as an act of love, obedience, and trust. I found that a kind of interesting mindset. That by allowing the leadership to baptize you, that you're, that's, a, that's a symbol of your submission to also God leading you in life as well. I kind of found that interesting. Not sure how I feel about it, but I shared that with you guys. So, and the water itself is symbolic of the grave. That as we are immersed, your old self dies and is buried just as Jesus died and was buried. And in the same way, just as Jesus rose to life again, you too rose from the water as a symbol of new life in him, as a brand new creation free of guilt and free from your past sin and death and shame, right? Because we have to understand that when we're talking about baptism, it's the representation of our old self dying to Christ, dying just as Christ died and was buried. Our old self is now dying and being buried. And when we're coming again, our old self stays there, right? Our dead self stays there, and we are made new and alive in Christ. That's the purpose of baptism, and that's really what baptism is. Broader baptism uses the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to symbol, symbolize our journey from death to life, from old to new. Romans chapter 16, 14 says this. For sin shall no longer be your master, Because you are not under the law, but under grace. I love that. This is a result of our baptism and salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Amen? We have to understand that water baptism requires faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay? requires faith in Jesus Christ and repentance of sins. Those are the two requirements of baptism. Faith in Jesus Christ and repentance of sins. Okay? So, I had this question recently. Should we baptize babies? No. It's not biblical. It's not biblical at all. We should not baptize babies because babies do not have the free will to choose salvation or to choose repentance of sins, okay? 
So baby, baby baptisms are not biblical. Now, we have baby dedications where we dedicate the baby into God because we have to understand that until the child is out of the home, they're still under the protection of the faith, the protection and the faith of their parents, right? right? So let me, let's just get that out of the way. We believe in baby dedications. We don't believe in baby baptisms because baptisms are dedicated or are meant for believers who have confessed their faith to Jesus Christ and repented of their sins and understand that they are a new creation their old self is dead, right? Then another, another powerful outcome of water baptism is that you step out of the water, you step out clean, you step out free, you step out empowered, you step out completely putting your old self behind you. And I love, I love hearing, hearing about testimonies just recently. And in fact, in the last three, four weeks, we've actually had the privilege of baptizing around six or seven people. And their stories are different. Their stories are different in what they experienced. I know that, that in one story I heard that as, as we baptized her, that she saw light under the water and she heard sounds like, 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 like singing and sounds in worship that as she came up, everything was clear for the first time. Colors were brighter for the first time. I had somebody else tell me that, that, that before they were baptized, and, and this person was a believer in Christ, that before they were baptized, they were struggling with confusion. They were struggling with voices in their head. They were struggling with these things. The moment they came out of the water, they had clear minds. Amen. Freedom in their minds. How powerful is that? See, being baptized, water baptized, makes a public declaration to God and others that you no longer consider your life to be your own. Your life now belongs to God. And as such, you look to his leadership and no longer your own. Galatians chapter 2 Verse 20 says this. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. Number three. Salvation and baptism. I kind of actually liked preparing this message because my titles, my, my points were very easy to choose. If you've, ever, if you've ever done a sermon with points, you understand that, right? But as we look at both salvation and water baptism, there is a question that arises when we're looking at this topic. And the question that arises is, do you need to be baptized in order to be saved? Does salvation require baptism and this is actually a debate that is going on currently across the christian world today do they belong completely intertwined together or are they separate we're going to look at this this morning so let me let me answer that question in the vaguest of ways are they one or are they different yes and no Yes and no. Are you ready for this? See, yes in the fact that they are different because we know and the Bible states very clearly that salvation is by faith. Right? But, hold on, we're going we're gonna to get to the no portion here in a second. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For by grace you have been saved through faith, right? John chapter 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. John chapter 12, 44 through 50. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now there's a lot in that statement right there that Christianity needs to hold on to. 
right? That this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a rabbit trail for a second because I can, because I'm preaching. Amen. As Christians, do we have a right to judge the world? No, we do not. We do not judge their actions. We do not judge those things because that is what the world is. And that is who the world is. The world is doing what the world does because it's the world, right? Now, can I judge you? I can. I can judge you because you belong into the church. Now, I can judge you out of love. I can correct you. I can bring you back into alignment. And I will also receive correction and uh, coming back into alignment as well, right? right? But we don't come against the world. Jesus even said, those who belong to me, I don't judge them. I came to love the world, not to judge the world, right? Right? Because if you start judging the world, what are they going to do? Ah, you're just one of them. I don't want anything to do with that, Jesus. Right? We love the world. Okay, anyways, let's go on. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The world that, uh, or the world that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And that's a scary thought. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I say, or what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And in Romans chapter 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I also say that it is separate in these two factors due to the fact that if we make the statement that baptism is required for salvation— in my mind, we're almost making baptism a work unto salvation. And we have to be very careful by having not those things. But, and if we look at, at, at justification, and I heard, I heard this argument this week as I was looking at it, that one person was saying baptism can't be a requirement of salvation because look at the thief on the cross, right? The thief on the cross wasn't baptized when he was, when he was entered into glory. God could, if it was a requirement, God could have opened up the heavens and had it rain and baptized him in that manner, right? But at the same time, the argument is that was pre-Christ's death and resurrection. That was pre-New Covenant. So there's a lot of these little, little, little arguments and little, little things here in this topic that actually makes it worth looking into even deeper. So yes, but also no, they are not separate. Because in Scripture, we have to we have been told also to be baptized and to baptize, okay? We have also to reconcile things that Jesus himself said about baptism, that the disciples said about baptism, and also what the apostles said about baptism, okay? So let's dive into some of those verses right now. Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned first peter 3 21 corresponding to that baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh but the appeal to god for a good conscience through the resurrection of jesus christ see peter is saying here that baptism does that because of what christ already did for you okay Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Acts chapter 2, 38 38 through 41. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How powerful is that statement right there? Just look at how powerful that statement is there. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. 
Are we not lack or are we not holding firmly to the word of God in that? Are, are, are we scheduling ser separate services for each one of these items? When Peter or when Peter is saying here, no, it happens at the same time. And it should happen at the same time. Repent, be baptized and your sins will be forgiven and you will be filled with Holy Spirit, right? That's an amazing thing right there. Now, of course, in that context, it could be saying the Holy Spirit fills you at the indwelling of salvation, not the actual baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that later, okay? For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word and were baptized, oh, for those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Galatians, now that's a good day of ministry right there, right? <laughs> Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then a powerful portion of Scripture found in Acts. Acts chapter 8, 36 through 37. 36 through 38, excuse me. Now, as they went down the road. Now, this is, this is talking about Philip, where God, he's in the midst of, of a revival. God picks him up and places him on this road in the middle of nowhere where he sees the, the guy, the, the guy who's, who's reading the scrolls and has no idea what he's, what he's reading. So he comes up and says, let me explain to you the book of Isaiah. So they start talking about that, right? Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Mm -hmm. Then Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. And I love that next portion of Scripture where it says, and then Jesus picked up Philip and took him somewhere else in the Spirit. <laughs> and the eunuch was standing there just praising God. He's like, okay, this guy was here, and now he's gone. I'm still going to praise God. Yeah. Right? But the key to understanding the concept of baptism at this time is to understand the culture also of the time. Because to be baptized in the culture of this time was to publicly declare, I am a follower of this person's teaching to all that I am. I am dedicating my heart and my life and everything I have to this person's teaching. So when people were being baptized, it was done immediately after salvation because they were saying, this is my new life. This is is my new identity. This is my new thing, right? This is now who I am in Christ. To be baptized at the time was to fully declare that you were following Christ in every aspect of his marriage, or message, excuse me. Oh, and marriage. Yeah, right? Now, I want to say this. Baptism is not a requirement of salvation, but it is an immediate response to salvation i say immediate response and i'm going to go into that just for a couple more minutes i'm starting to close it's immediate response to salvation i believe that in the church current church culture that we have elevated baptism to this lofty place and at the same time diminished its importance i say that because we have made whole services around a baptism sunday but we diminish it from the fact of it being a commandment of Jesus Christ. It is a commandment of Jesus Christ that we go out, make disciples, and baptize them. See, we've allowed this excuse to come into the culture of the church saying, you have to make sure that you're ready for baptism. You have to make sure that you're ready. Why? You've already accepted Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior. Right. The very next step is to be baptized. Why do we idolize something that Christ says, this is part of what you do? Right. This is part of your walk in Christ, and this is part of what you are called to do, right? Jesus didn't say, go, make disciples of all nations, and then make a time a year down the road where you can gather everybody together and then find a place for you to baptize them. He didn't say that. He said, go into the world, make disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, I am now, oh, and don't, 
This is what drives me crazy. Don't say, oh, I've got to get ready for it. You've already taken the step. You've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Baptism is laying the old man to death. Let me pose this question to you. If we allow people time to get ready for it, are we allowing the spirit of the flesh on them to hold on to them even longer? Are we allowing old man to stay old man in themselves? Because what is the purpose of baptism? The purpose of baptism is to lay the old man down in the grave, saying the old man is dead. The new man is raised to life. So have we as, as a church been unintentionally keeping people in bondage based on not being obedient to the word of God? When the word of God says, go make disciples and baptize them, he didn't say there's a spirit of time where this happens. No, it's immediate response to your salvation. It's immediate response to salvation. It's immediate response to freedom. It's immediate response to the old life being dead, that you no longer identify with the old life, that you are now a new life in Christ. This is the importance of baptism. And this is why baptism is so intertwined with salvation, because you cannot be saved and keep on to the old life. Baptism frees you from the old man. It frees you from the old man. And it lays the old man to death. See, baptism... We should not make services around baptism. Baptism should be done immediately after salvation. Immediately after salvation. If not immediately, the very next day. But pastor, I just don't have the time. Are we prioritizing God's word over, are we prioritizing our time over the very word of God? Are we prioritizing my desires, my wants over the very act of obedience to what the Word of God tells us to do. Church, I say this. Baptism is not a requirement for salvation. But baptism is very much a part of the process of salvation. It is very much a part of the process. When you're saved, the Word of God tells us that we baptize immediately. If the apostles and the disciples followed this practice, what makes us think that we should be any different? If Jesus himself followed this practice, what makes us think that we should be any different? If the word of God says that we need to follow this practice, why do we think that we should be any different? I'm telling you, as the church, we have made it an idol and have removed it of its importance. When the act of baptism goes hand in hand, with the act of salvation. It's intimately connected to salvation. Amen? Amen? See, because I've heard too many stories lately of people saying that they were struggling and baptism set them free. Baptism in itself, I believe, is a form of deliverance because it's laying the old man dead. It's laying your past to die. It's laying your past identity, who you were before Christ. You are laying that person down in the grave. And as you rise up, you are saying, I am no longer that person. I am no longer struggling in those areas. I'm no longer accepting that old life that I am new and I'm brand new and I'm alive in Christ. Amen? Amen. So I believe now that baptism is very important response to salvation because it also brings freedom in our obedience to Christ. So if you're saying this morning, Pastor, I've never been baptized, but I believe Christ is my Lord and Savior, I want to baptize you immediately. If not today, well, whenever you're free, right? But do not hold that mentality of, I need to get ready for it. You're already ready for it. You've already accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's already your Lord and Master. The only decision you have to make is, I no longer want to be this person. I now want to lay my past down to die and be alive in Christ. Amen? Amen. Stand with me this morning. And know that if you lead somebody to Christ, you don't have to call me. Pastor, can you meet me down here 
to, 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 to baptize this person. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ, are you not? You have the authority to cast out demons, do you not? That means you have the authority to baptize people as well. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, right now, God, we just come before you. We just praise your name. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. And Father, we thank you so much for the gift of salvation. We thank you so much for while we were yet enemies, while we were still sinners, you met us where you where we were. You found value in us. You saw worth in me while I was a sinner, while I was still your enemy. You reconciled yourself to me. So, Father, I thank you so much. And I thank you so much for the practice of, self, of baptism, for, for your example, Jesus, for, follow, for we following you in baptism, that we are laying our old self to die. We are no longer identifying with that person. We're no longer identifying any part of that person, that we are now a new, alive in Christ as a new creation, a new person in you. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that this sparks a desire in our hearts to seek out more of your word, to fully more understand your word. And as we go in through these foundational truths, that you start opening up our minds right now in the name of Jesus. In fact, I come against the spirit of religion right now. That Holy Spirit, that you bind it, that I bind that spirit of religion in Jesus' name that you cannot cloud the minds of people anymore, that you cannot cloud the minds of, and focus them on tradition, that we only focus upon what the Word of God says. So, Spirit of religion, if you're here, we bind you and we cast you out in the name of Jesus. And Father, I just ask that you open up our hearts to hear and receive your Word as we go on down these foundational truths, as we start looking at what the Word of God says, you open up our hearts and give us a desire, burn with us a desire to seek out your word, to study your word, God, to search it out for ourselves, Father. I just ask these things in your name, in the very name of Jesus. And I want to encourage you this morning that if you have not been baptized, come talk to me after service. Come talk to me after service. Because we want to get you baptized. If you do not know the Lord is your Lord and Savior, I want to introduce you to him as well. Amen. So if that's you, come talk to me after service right now. Amen? Amen. 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 But Father, as we go out of this place this morning, I just declare a blessing upon these people. That you are the one who goes before them. You are the one who stands behind them. You are the one who hands them in on either side. And I ask a divine intervention this week, Father, that we have to step out and actually go into the world, Father. That we actually go and preach the good news of salvation and baptism. And I just ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Let's bless the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Go tell somebody you like them and you love them too and mean it. Amen. <laughs>